The ethical world showed its fate and its truth to be the spirit that had merely passed away in it, the individual self. This legal person, however, has its substance and fulfillment outside of that world. The movement of the world of culture and faith does away with this abstraction of the person, and through the completed alienation, through the ultimate abstraction, substance becomes for spirit at first the universal will, and finally spirit's own possession. Here, then, knowledge appears at last to have become completely identical with its truth. For its truth is this very knowledge, and any antithesis between the two sides has vanished. Vanished not only for us or in itself, but for self-consciousness itself. In other words, self-consciousness has gained the mastery over the antithesis within consciousness itself. This antithesis rests on the antithesis of the certainty of self and of the object. Now, however, the object is for consciousness itself, the certainty of itself, that is, knowledge. Just as the certainty of itself as such no longer has ends of its own, is therefore no longer contained within a determinateness, but is pure knowledge. Here in paragraph 596, Hegel is taking us into a new section which is called spirit that is certain of itself morality. And before we go into these introductory paragraphs at the very beginning of this third main part of the spirit portion of the work, let's stop for a moment and talk about these two terms, ethics or ethical and morality and moral. Because I want to get a prevalent um, misunderstanding and misreading out of the way right at the beginning. I will probably have to stress this at a number of points uh, throughout this, this entire commentary on this section. In ethics, or the study of, of right and wrong, good and bad, moral norms, uh, however you want to conceive of it, we often make a distinction between ethics on the one hand and morality on the other. And we use these terms ethical and moral uh, along with that distinction. Now, here's where the problem arises. Many people make that distinction. Many people make it different ways. So, for example, in uh, an Anglophone uh, introduction to ethical theory textbook, you may find the author saying something like, morality is simply the codes by which we live. It's not particularly thought out. It's not reflective. It's just you know, what we've inherited from our culture, from parents, from institutions like uh, school, church, et cetera, et cetera. And ethical refers to what has really been thought through, what has been consciously reflected upon, and that's the discipline of ethics that we're going to begin doing now. So if you adopt that point of view, you have almost the exact opposite of what Hegel himself has in mind in using these terms. It gets a little bit more complicated as well by the fact that uh, ethical is really a translation of a German term, uh, Zitlich, uh, you know, coming from Zitten, um, which, you know, is, is a translation or, or a cognate, uh, you might say, in, in some sense, to ethos, right? But also to mores. So all these terms get really mixed up, and it's very important when we're thinking about a particular author that we look at what that author is actually saying, how they're using these concepts and distinctions. So for Hegel, the ethical is really more like what a culture gives you. It's what you have by virtue of participating in that culture, taking on the roles that you have inherited or been assigned, uh, find yourself in, there is certainly room for improvisation and, and uh, you know, doing more than merely what a code, uh, Hegel never uses the word code actually, 
but a lot of other people later on will use that. Um, there's room for doing something that goes beyond the code, but it remains harnessed, you could say, to that perspective. And we saw this earlier in the spirit section. So this is a great place to go to the text, right? Here Hegel is giving us kind of a summary of the path that we've traversed. He says, the ethical world showed its fate and its truth to be the spirit that had merely passed away in at the individual self. Great. What's the ethical world that he's talking about there? In the earliest parts of the spirit section, we had that whole discussion and all these interesting dialectical transformations of the, um, you might say the family or the gods, right? The divine law and then the human law and the human institutions that went along with that and the clash between them. We saw Hegel using Sophocles' Antigone as an example of this, but there are so many other great examples as well that work just fine for us. This is a problematic that we can still see happening today, but that was at the beginning of the spirit section. And we saw that, where did it culminate? In what Hegel is calling here, the legal person. And, and you remember that section, the legal person culminated in the Lord of the world and a kind of universal alienation, except for the Lord of the world. And even he or she wasn't entirely uh, content with, with their, their status. So we have an unresolved problematic that actually didn't begin there. If you remember even further back, it was starting to emerge in the reason section in those uh, last two parts of it. Once we got past the, you know, observing reason and physiognomy and all that other stuff. And we got into discussion of, um, you know, virtue and the law of the heart and, you know, reason giving laws to itself. All of that business led us into this, this ethical world. And what we've got there is a, a lack of fulfillment. Consciousness does not truly find itself either in the institutions of the ethical world or through the individual who is attempting to traverse them. So he says this legal person has its substance. That's a term that he's going to use quite a bit in this and the following paragraph, substance, and we'll come back to that, and fulfillment outside of that world. The true meaning of it is not within that ethical world. So what do we transition to next? We get the world of culture. And the world of culture turns out to be, you know, there's this long, complicated dialectic of the noble and base consciousness and wealth and state power and finally a kind of sophisticated attitude of ironic detachment, uh, sort of insanity that goes along with that, similar to that of skepticism, right? And we have a, a state that's in some respects similar to, but also different from the unhappy consciousness. It cannot realize itself. So there's an alienation going on there. And what is the ultimate remedy for that? Well, it's, it's faith and insight. And for a long time, faith dominates and provides some sort of alternative. And these are a world, you could say, beyond the merely ethical world. And these are not new worlds, as if you like step from this world into this world. Rather, they, they interpenetrate each other, just as did the world in the uh, discussion about the, the uh, world of perception, the inverted world, and then the world of, of, of the laws and essences in the um, early section, in the consciousness portion of the work, uh, force and the understanding. So these are worlds that are adding greater and greater sophistication to what's going on here. He says, the movement of the world of culture and faith does away with this abstraction of the person. And then he talks about another transition. Through the completed alienation through the ultimate abstraction. What's this completed alienation and ultimate abstraction? Well, we pass through the enlightenment, 
which is going to be critical both of culture and faith and of the previous ethical. And we eventually wind up at the point of absolute freedom where knowledge and will turn out to be the same thing. All right. And he says that through this, now here's that term again, substance becomes for spirit at first the universal will and then finally spirit's own possession. So what do we mean by substance here? Um, put aside conceptions. This will be helpful for you at this point. Put aside conceptions of substance as that out of which everything is made or anything along those lines and think rather in terms of that which is going to be most relevant, most important, what is holding our attention. Think of substance as like essence, vesen in this case. And substance by itself, unless it's becoming subject, doesn't have full agency and isn't conscious of itself. And yet it is that in which things, you could say, have their play, reside. Now, this is sort of like the earlier conception of substance, as usia, you know, the, the substance as subject of predicates. But we also want it as the subject of agency, and we want substance to be aware of itself. So he says, substance becomes for spirit, the first, first the universal will, and then finally spirit's own possession. And then he says, here, knowledge appears at last to have become completely identical with its truth. And that raises an interesting question. We talk about knowledge of the truth, and then we're treating the truth as if it's something out there, and our knowledge is a relation of ourselves to that truth. And that's the way it is for many things. You know, the chalk is white. Okay, uh, I gotta look at the chalk. Is it white? Yep, it's white. <laughs> you look at the chalk right now. Uh, there's a truth. And we could say, well, the truth is actually in the, those propositions or something like that. But, I mean, Hegel would, there's an earlier conception of truth where the truth is also in the thing and its relations to other stuff. So why would knowledge and truth then coincide? Because it's knowledge of the self. Knowledge of the self as rooted in all of these dynamics. So he goes on and he says... Its truth is this very knowledge and any antithesis. And here the, the word that's being translated as antithesis is gegensatz. Any contradiction, any true opposition between these two has vanished. Now here Hegel says something really interesting. It's not only vanished for us or in itself, right? And these are these two categories that uh, Hegel uses all the time in contrast with each other. Being in itself, being for itself, or for another. But notice at this time he doesn't say for itself. Being in itself and for itself. He says being in itself and being for us. What do we have beyond that? Not in place of it, but beyond that. He says uh, any antithesis, any contradiction between the two sides has vanished, vanished for us. So it has vanished for us, vanished in itself, important there, but also for self-consciousness itself. Selbstbewusstsein selbst, right? There's a repetition there, an intensification. So he says, now here it gets even more interesting, self-consciousness has gained the mastery over the antithesis within consciousness itself. That is the dialectical advance that has taken place in the absolute freedom section and now leading us into this morality, uh, I almost said morality play. <laughs> uh, and it really is a play in many respects, uh, as you'll see in the later paragraphs, but in this morality section, this, this dynamic that's taking place here. So he goes on and he says, um, this antithesis rests on the antithesis of the certainty of self and of the object. Now, he says, 
The object is for consciousness itself the certainty of itself, knowledge. Just as the certainty of itself as such no longer has ends of its own, is no longer contained within indeterminateness, but is pure knowledge. What does all this mean? In this new attitude uh, of morality, remember, spirit through self-consciousness has truly become conscious of what it is, and it's, it's extricated itself in, in an ideal way, not necessarily, you know, given the actual person that, that I am or, or, or it is in that place, but it's it extricated itself from all of these ways of identifying itself, and it's grasped itself as universal and the other as equally universal. This opens up the possibility for what Hegel now is calling morality, moralitet. And I, I mentioned that we needed to think beyond the ethical as simply you know, what we're inheriting from our culture, adapting in certain ways. Um, morality is going to be more universal for Hegel. And because of that, there's also going to be an alienation involved, but I'm foreshadowing and saying that. So um, a lot of transitions here, and now we have to see what else he has to tell us about this new section. Thus, for self-consciousness, its knowledge is the substance itself. This substance is for it just as immediate as it is absolutely mediated in an indivisible unity. It is immediate like the ethical consciousness which knows its duty and does it and is bound up with it as with its own nature. But it is not character as that ethical consciousness is which on account of its immediacy is a specifically determined spirit belongs only to one of the ethical essentialities and has the characteristic of not knowing. It is absolute mediation like the consciousness which cultivates itself and the consciousness which believes. For it is essentially the movement of the self to set aside the abstraction of immediate existence and to become conscious of itself as a universal and yet to do so neither by the pure alienation and disruption of itself and of actuality, nor by fleeing from it. Rather, it is immediately present to itself and its substance, for this is its knowledge, is the intuited pure certainty of itself, and just this immediacy which is its own reality is all reality, for the immediate is being itself, and as pure immediacy purified by absolute negativity, it is being in general or all being. Paragraph 597 is further developing this distinction between the ethical and the moral here in this section on spirit that is, is certain of itself, morality. So how is it certain of itself? It has to do with its grasp of not only itself, but, but its, its grasp of the other and its relation to it within a kind of overarching community. So he says, for self-consciousness, its knowledge is the substance itself. That's worth dwelling on. Its knowledge is the substance itself. So it's not as if you simply have a substance that then became self-aware, at least in part, and it's sort of picturing itself to itself. No, there's, there's a relation of, you might say, self-transparency, as it understands what it is, it takes on a substantiality, you could say. So he goes on and he says, this substance is for it just as immediate as is, it is absolutely mediated in an indivisible unity. So it's both immediate and mediated at the same time. And you might say, big deal, everything. <laughs> that we've ever seen in the dialectic up till this point that we think is immediate turns out to be mediated at the same time, right? There's always this, this uh, let's put it out there, immediate. All right, sense certainty, boom! There's some, immediate, there's some mediation going on there, the universal, right? Well, in this case, it's aware of itself as both immediate and mediated. That's an important difference. 
So he goes on and he says, it is immediate like the ethical consciousness. The ethical consciousness knows its duty and does it. Now, of course, we're, we're forgetting all of the other twists and turns in which it kind of wavers and tries to get a little bit of stuff for itself. Uh, put all that aside for the moment. This is a little bit of an idealization, but we've got an ethical consciousness. And this arises at many different points, including in the reason section, including even going all the way back to the master-slave dialectic. If the slave is taking on the character of slave, or something along those lines. It's finding its meaning within the ethical substance. That was a term that Hegel used quite a bit, which essentially is the community and its workings. So he says, um, it's immediate like the self ethical consciousness, which knows its duty. So it knows that and does it and is bound up with it as with its own nature. But it, meaning the moral consciousness is not character as, so this is really key, that ethical consciousness is, why? On account of its immediacy, it is, here, here's the key idea, it is a specifically determined spirit, mind, geist, belongs only to one of the ethical essentialities, we're going to come back to that, and has the characteristic of not knowing. It doesn't grasp the totality. It doesn't grasp itself as anything more than a moment of a larger system. It, it can, in fact, get things wrong and think that it is the main show, as we see happening with state power or we see happening with, uh, you know, the, the alienated individual within culture, right? But it doesn't grasp how it fits in with the other ethical, we can call them characters, or the other agencies within the ethical substance. We also have the problem that antitheses arise or contradictions arise between different representatives of the ethical substance. Um, you know, the conflict between wealth and state power, between the noble and ignoble consciousness. Prime example earlier on, the conflict between the human and divine law, between the family and the state. All of these are case and points where what should be one unified ethical substance is turned against itself. And to have character means lining oneself up for one against another. The moral consciousness is not like that. Why not? Okay, so here is where this, this, this importance of knowing itself comes in. Right? He says, um, the moral consciousness is absolute mediation. How so? He clarifies, like the consciousness which cultivates itself and the consciousness which believes. So the consciousness which cultivates itself was the consciousness of culture, the Bildung section, the consciousness which believes, which Glauben, right, faith. Um, he says, it's essentially the movement of the self to set aside the abstraction of immediate existence, what was there in the ethical, and to become conscious of itself as a universal. Now, here's where there's something different. Here's where something has been achieved through the absolute freedom section. Yet to do so neither by the pure alienation and disruption of itself and of actuality, what happened in the culture section, nor by fleeing from it, right? Nor by doing, for that matter, any of enlightenment's analogs to that, there are just as many dead ends to the dialectic in the enlightenment section as there are in the faith section as there are in the culture section. If we proceed through and come out on the other side, then we arrive at this point where, where moral consciousness becomes possible, he says. <clears throat> so he says, it's immediately present to itself in its substance. For this substance, what it is, what it grasps itself as, is... Uh, this knowledge, it is the intuited pure certainty of itself and just this immediacy, which is its own reality, is all reality for the immediate being, the immediate is being itself and is pure immediacy purified by absolute negativity says it is being in general or all being. <clears throat> now, 
Do we have to have passed through the French Revolution in order to uh, make this possible? Probably not. Um, if you think, for example, about the methodology that is involved in both the rationalist and the empiricist tradition, it's a looking at what is there within the self in its, its consciousness. And you see this culminating in Kant very clearly in, in both the first critique, which is about speculative, or as he calls it, pure reason, and even more so in the second critique. Here's all I'm going to say about this at, at this point. What we've got here is in Hegel talking about this, you know, absolute knowing of itself, immediacy, you know, and mediation. I grasp myself as a human being, <clears throat> as such, like you, and I can speak for both of us because you're also permitted to speak within this moral community, and we work out, this is going to sound very Habermasian, we work out norms, we work out what ought to be the case by thinking about what, what does in fact include and apply to and incorporate both of us. And we do so in a way very different than that of the ethical, where everybody has their, their assigned place and function and character. In this, we ought to all be substitutable for each other. This is how you get to something like Kant's categorical imperative, right? Or any of the other things that are analogous to it in moral theory. Absolute essential being is, therefore, not exhausted when determined as the simple essence of thought. It is all reality, and this reality is only as knowledge. What consciousness did not know would have no significance for consciousness and can have no power over it. Into its conscious will, all objectivity, the whole world has withdrawn. It is absolutely free in that it knows its freedom, and just this knowledge is its substance and purpose and its sole content. Paragraph 598 ends this short introductory section to the morality part of spirit, which is, you know, going to be about another 70-odd paragraphs, quite a lot of the work, if you think about the fact that the, the phenomenology of spirit actually only has a little over 800 paragraphs, um, 70 is really the, the length of the preface, so it's, you know, about one twelfth of, of the entire work. So this is an important section. And Hegel is bringing together some of the threads that he's laid out. I'd mentioned in, in the earlier paragraphs that we want to think about this in terms of essence, not just substance. And here he actually uses the term essence. Miller translates it as essential being, but it's just Wesen in, in the German, right? Absolute Wesen. Uh, he says absolute essential being is not exhausted, not just, you know, uh, emptied out when determined as the simple, what again? Essence of thought, the Wesen of thought. He says it's all reality. And this reality is only as knowledge. Now, here's where you can see Hegel's idealism showing, but, but this is not an idealism that starts from idealism as a uh, axiom or something like that. This is saying that the world, just as at the beginning of observing reason, right, and in the other reason parts, this is what it means for human consciousness to develop. It sort of devours the world and incorporates it and makes it its own. So he says, um, it's all reality, all Wirklichkeit, and this reality is as knowledge. So he says, what consciousness did not know would have no significance for consciousness and can have no power over it. Now, that's rather optimistic. And you might say, well, what about unconscious, you know, desires or something like that? You know, you might bring up depth psychology. Well, when you bring them out, don't they become conscious in a way? Yes, and, and they get sucked into the realm of thought. And we could go on and on and on with examples like this. So he says, into its conscious will. 
Now notice he's using that term will there. We are dealing with the practical realm, not just a realm of pure speculation or of science understood as this, you know, a uh, way of making sense of the universe and perhaps m afterwards applying technology. This is driven by a will. So well, this will come back uh, in, in further paragraphs. Into its conscious will, all objectivity, the whole world has withdrawn, he says. Now, it's a free will. It is absolutely free, he says, in that it knows its freedom. And, he says, just this knowledge is its substance and its purpose and its sole content, what does that mean? Once again, spirit as self-consciousness has found itself in a particular new state or shape, gestalt of consciousness, and it's being presented with that, and now it has to figure out, great, this is in front of me, I know something about myself, what the hell does this all mean? That is what it's going to be figuring out as we move now into the next portion of this section of the work.